Welcome to the Porter & Company Black Label Podcast, your home for provocative insights that lead to lasting wealth. And here are your hosts, Porter Stansberry and Aaron Brabham. This is Porter & Company Black Label Podcast. Of course, I'm your co-host host, Aaron Brabham. I have a voice not for radio. Porter always says he has a face for... I have a face for radio. A face for radio. So we actually have a horrible combination up here. Yeah, I got the bad voice and the bad face. We're I don't even know what we're doing. teammates. Right? And, of course, we have Meb Faber tonight. We were supposed to have Macro Alf over there. You'll see in the corner. Uh, it's, a, it's a little snafu of Country Club guy. Country, oh. country club guy kind of got dropped the ball a little bit. Ouch. And uh, fortunately, Meb was, in, out. Meb was in Chicago, and he was at the CBOE as 10-year anniversary for Cambria. So we're really happy to have him down, and congratulations. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was ready to come enjoy a nice mellow night, have a cocktail, relax. I get off the plane. You just put me to work. Yep. Meb's a, a, a very old and good friend. And Meb's been around our newsletter business for, geez, 20 years now. Not as old as you. Not quite, yep. Well, anyways, we're really glad to have Meb here. Uh, Brabzy, uh, are you going to lo- lo- launch the show? Yeah, so uh, we figure we'll kick it off with the interview, and then we'll get into some kind of nonsense. But we always like to start off with something that we want to give our, our, our valued subscribers, uh, something financial, right? And, Porter, I know that you've been talking about this lately. Um, you know, we have our forever portfolio pretty much right uh sorry i know that's what you originally created with with austin but we're we have the long portfolio and long investments but you've become a little bearish lately yes concerned uh, would love would love to know uh how many people in the room think that unemployment can get to 10 percent or more by the end of next year so i'm not the only bear in the room What's going on in the financial markets reminds me so much of the summer of 07 and the fall of 07. Uh, People forget that the subprime banking system blew up in July of 07, but the Dow did not peak until November of 07. And there are these huge losses in the financial system that the banks were pretending didn't exist. Kind of like what's going on in commercial real estate. (laughs) So a, a good a good friend of mine who's in my hunt club and and the county here, um, names will be withheld. Uh, he works for a a major financial institution, a big regional bank, and he is getting three buildings a week returned to him, and there is no bid. So it, there is a there is an enormous cascade of defaults and people handing back the keys. And it's not yet because of interest rates. It's only because there are no tenants in any of these office buildings. As the things that are financing apartments and malls and retail roll over at higher rates, how are they going to push the resulting increase to rents onto the tenants? They can't especially a lot of the tenants are now paying. I think I'm bothering Scout's ears. My own dog doesn't want to listen to me. He's like, oh, this again. So anyways, I I just think you have that same pig in the python that's working through the financial system that we had last time with residential. And just to be clear, the problems that we had in residential were multiple trillions. This isn't that big, but it's still going to be a big problem for the banks especially when you look at what's going on with deposit flight. And I don't want to give away my presentation for tomorrow. There's more to come. But just ask yourself this. If Bank of America is only paying you 0.8% and you can get 5.5% in 30-day treasuries, are you stupid? And if Bank of America's business plan is to bet on stupidity, I'm, they're not going to go broke immediately, but they will go broke eventually. But but that's also but that's also a, a pretty accurate observation as we love to do polls on Twitter and elsewhere just to kind of gauge sentiment. And we often will ask people, and by the way, this is a little too close to home because I, I think I'm a Bank of America preferred rewards customer and it's eight basis points. 
The regular Bank of America is down near like four or five. So I'm like double, okay? So, but you ask people, and I know this audience is not that demographic, but you ask people and you pull them, you say, what do you earn on your cash balance in your savings or checking? And they say, the majority answers, I don't know. It's Twitter, so you can be anonymous, right? So you don't, you're, there's no shame in answering. I don't know, zero to one is like 80% of the people. And, and very much, we talk so much about investing and where to find the great returns, and that's just like the basics, right? Like you, you that's free alpha, that's just laziness. And so when the banks failed, was that this year? It feels like five years ago, Silicon Valley Bank, et cetera. So many of the lessons were just laziness, and yet people, not this audience, but most of the population is too, too lazy to even deal with it. I would just say that the hoping your clients don't notice is not a good strategy. And they, they've, they've got a big problem because 40% of their balance sheet is, um, you know, is holding 2% treasuries. How, how are they going to pay 5%? They can't. And, the, and my advice to you is don't be the last in line to get your money out of Bank of America. And if you think Bank of America is going to have a run on it, which it will, why would you be long stocks? We're, we're, we are going to have a Minsky moment because the banking system cannot survive the losses that it has in commercial real estate and the losses that it has relative to duration risk. And when I say duration risk, what I'm talking about is the fact that the government borrowed seven trillion dollars at one percent and the banks bought it all and that there's there's hell to pay for that decision so but what would i know because I, just imagine if i told you that fanny and freddie were going to zero who would have ever believed that there's this thing called math real rare sunshine here on the first night of the presentation i i also like that i have a heckler uh, my name is Meb. My name is Meb uh, Faber, short for Mebin. If any North Carol any North Carolinians here? Oh wow, we got a bunch. All right, so you guys know Meb in North Carolina. All right, my people, what's up? I live in Los Angeles now, so a long way away. And, and, and Meb, Meb, we didn't do a very good job of introducing you. No, I know. I mean, you can forgive. I was getting heckled in the beginning for wearing a hat. I just got off the airplane and came straight here. We were, I was ringing the bell, the Chicago Board of Options Exchange yesterday in Chicago, and Porter says, you gotta come to this Stevenson, Maryland, and I said, okay, I can make it. Um, so forgive, forgive me, um, but Meb, nice to meet you. Tomorrow, you'll get suit Meb tomorrow. Okay. Wow. I'm getting heckled. You know, I'm usually the one doing the heckling. Yeah, I know. This, this is, is, this is, is a, a, it's, it's a new someone's, twist. Someone's turning the tables on it's a, us. It's a new, I figured I'd be getting heckled. It's a new <laughs> twist. Well, I mean, it's kind of on you guys. Have you learned nothing from the Black Label show? Like having cocktails while you're doing this? Uh, okay, never, okay, let's let's has not get never to, gone for, well. All right, Meb, let's not get the crowd you stirred up. You learned your lesson. Let's not get the crowd stirred up because I got pulled aside a lot. I got pulled aside a lot by a lot of uh, fantastic subscribers and longtime listeners. And, and they said they're long armers. And long armers, too. They can afford the ham sandwich. And I really appreciate that. But the number one thing that I got, Porter, was... Man, I think the woke culture got you guys. You guys are playing it too safe. And you I said, it. we cost this guy a billion dollars. A billion dollars. But can, raise your hands or give us a clap if you think we might should get a little more black label-ish. I got, my, my kids told me that, that uh, no one had ever been canceled three times before. I got canceled three times, Meb. I'm going to have to run this through compliance. You are. You, you're not even allowed to sit next to me. Yeah. All right, Porter. So, um, you know, one thing that, that we're going to be talking about soon is uh, we're going to be doing something special with Trade Smith and Trade Stops, right? And we're going to have something with Keith, who's a good friend of yours. And we're going to start talking a little bit more about possibly uh, doing some trailing stops and things like that. What, what would your advice be for this audience right now? for kind of positioning for this bearish run, and maybe I'm stealing your thunder for tomorrow, but some basic things that they should start thinking about right now for the portfolio. Yeah, I think that you've got to take a look at your portfolio just like you should have in 07, and you got to realize that two things are going to happen simultaneously. One, um, 
a whole lot of excess is going to get wrung out of the financial system because there's going to be a whole lot of defaults. That's already occurring. It's, an, it's occurring in very large scale, and you've got to be blind if you don't see it coming. Uh, one of my favorite charts that I'll show you tomorrow, Meb, is the, the decline in the bottom 80% of incomes, banking accounts, <laughs> goes like this, and the rise of credit card balances goes like this. And so, you know, that's not sustainable for very long, and we all know what's going to happen next. Default rates on auto loans, which are now over $1,000 a month for a lot of people. Default rates on credit cards are coming. And then the big problem that you've got with deposit flight because of the duration risk inside the banks and because of the, the defaults on commercial mortgages. So the, we're, going to, we're going to head into a big default cycle. So if you raise cash now, you will be well positioned for... I'm going to say a, a peak of this crisis will be somewhere between 12 and 18 months from now. And we've got Marty Fritzen, who knows more about distressed debt than any other human being in the history of Wall Street. So we're going to have lots of opportunities. There's going to be a great... People are like, oh, well, you're saying these bad things. I'm like, no, these are all great things. You know, If you get a chance next year to buy Hershey at 12 times earnings, you're going to be really excited. And you should be. The, the, the world's not coming to an end. Just a whole lot of bad decisions are going to, you know, do what they were destined to do from the very beginning. They're going to lead to failure. And uh, if you, just one small stat, and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut the hell up. But think about this for a second. There are, in the United States today, the government raises $2.3 trillion a year through income taxes. Virtually all of it comes from the top 10% of wage earners in the United States, a.k.a. the people in this room. All right? They're running a $2 trillion deficit. If that, if that doesn't just speak caution to you, then I would re suggest some remedial math. <laughs> there is no way to double the income tax take. And sure, I understand. The income taxes are not, are not total tax receipts. I know. But ultimately, the income taxes are what, are what are, is funding our government. The government is, is, is so out of control in spending that there is no way that interest rates are going to, to decrease, and there is no way to stop the spending. So there's, there is going to be a reckoning because there is no way that people can afford the kind of debts that they're used to taking at 7% and 8% mortgages. There's no way. So there's going to be a giant decrease in consumer demand. There's going to be a, a, lot, of, a lot of big failures. And again, I'm giving away my presentation for tomorrow, but let me ask you this question. Has anybody in this room considered going on a carnival cruise this year? Okay, I feel sorry for you. It's brave to admit it. Go for the Ritz-Carlton one. It's way better. You do not want to go on the southwest of boats. Just an opinion. But my point is, if you can't make money in cruises this year, you will never make money. So guess how much debt Carnival Cruises has added in the last five years? And guess what they earned this year? They lost money. So they've added billions and billions and billions in debt, and they still can't make money, much less pay a higher interest rate. And there's lots of companies that are like that. The most famous one is Boeing, and nobody sees it coming, just like nobody saw it when I was writing about GM in 05 and 06. Major, major, major U.S. companies are going to go bankrupt, and they're going to fail, because right now they cannot even earn enough money to pay their interest. And again, what, what do you hear from the Wall Street Journal? What do you hear from anyone in mainstream media? Nothing. Think about, think about this. In, in, in 19 of the last 20 years before GM went bankrupt, it had to borrow money to pay interest. Did anyone tell you that? No. And guess what? It's now government motors. And even though the unions own it and run it, they're striking. It's never going to work. Um, so, so is the answer we just... T bills and chill, waiting for the dark Ex times to come. Like exactly. What? Yeah. You uh, you you raise thirty to forty percent of your portfolio in cash. You put it in thirty day T bills, and you wait for the opportunity that's so obvious it hits you in the forehead, and that's all you got to do. But one thing I got to say about GM, just because it's my favorite kicking horse, is Biden actually recently claimed that that Mary Barra, who you guys might remember, I dressed up as one time that Mary Barra invented electric cars. That's according to President Biden. 
Last year, General Motors sold 34, not 34,000, 34 electric cars. Yeah, and actually Ford uh, was doing a big run for their Ranger, which has been the number one gauge that you've always looked at because it's the number one car sold. And they have, the I forget what it's called, the, the Lightning. They, no, no they, one's are, buying the Lightning. they are getting wrecked on that completely. People are completely turning in their money right now saying, you know what, I don't want it. Because guess what? Uh, EV that's because they're waiting on the cyber truck. Porter. We knew this for a long time ago when we had the podcast. I thought, I thought that batteries ago. made made energy. What, what, you mean you need, I need coal for that? What? You got to plug it into something, right? Oh, about, one of my favorite things. Matt, what do you think is going on in Europe? Let me ask you a question about this. My, my friend Brian Hunt, who is a, a brilliant guy, you guys, you, brought, you may have never heard of Brian Hunt. He runs a business for MarketWise called Alta now. Before that, it was called Investor Place. It's a business that has been publishing uh, Louis Navalier for 30 years. I bought it in 2016, 2017 for $5 million, something like that. And I, and I put Hunt in charge of running it. He's done a great job. And at that business this year is going to do $120 million in sales. He's a great publisher. He's a great guy. And if you don't subscribe to Louis Navalier, you should. He does a good job with growth stocks. Anyways, sales pitch over. What I wanted to tell you was so funny about Hunt is he's like, have you ever seen anything more fucked in your life than Germany? L let me get this straight. We, we, um, we outsourced our energy policy to Putin. We outsourced our foreign policy to America. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and we're the land of unions. What do you think happens next? So I, I just, yeah, America has problems, but we're also the most innovative, by far the most productive society in the world. And if you're not long America, you need, you need help. Yes, Porter, I absolutely agree. You know, there are a lot of positive about America, and, and policy is the problem, right? It's day one. Porter, uh, you know, when I who joined— do you, Who do you think blew up that gas pipeline underwater? Well, we already know. We already know exactly who did it. Who could that um, have been? I don't know. Well, Biden— It wasn't me. Well, Biden's on record saying he would do exactly that. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. <laughs> That's an old Shaggy reference, yeah. by the way. It wasn't me. <laughs> Uh, so Porter, yeah, but, but by the way, in the like in the, the the vein of Forbes, I feel like we might have a Porter and Company cruise. I mean, you got to partner with maybe Viking. Who's the, who's a good cruise company? I don't know. Crystal. Okay. Norwegian. Crystal. Yeah. yeah so Meb, what are you? Uh, what kind of two sons? What kind of advice are you giving for your clients right now? What are the things that you're writing about and you're hot on? Oh my goodness. Um, you know, I, I think. Um, there was about 12 different things in the last uh, 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 little comment section here by Porter. Um, you came into this, um, you mentioned like talking about stops. And I, I think one of the challenges as humans that are very emotional is becoming wedded to an asset. And look, God bless you, but I guarantee you there's people in the audience who are like, you know what? I'm a gold bug through and through. I think gold's going to 5,000, and it might. But you have to at least mentally prepare for the possibility it'll trade down to 1,000, 500 bucks. You have to prepare for the, You have to prepare for the possibility that U.S. stocks will go down 80%. That's happened before, right? My favorite investing book, Triumph of the Optimist. You look back at the last 100 years, Things were crazy, right? And one of the biggest problems in life, in markets, but also in life, is when you have some expectations and you're wedding to them. I'm going to marry this girl. I love her. Whatever it may be, it doesn't work out. People are devastated. I want this job, my identity. I'm going to sell my company for $3 billion. Right. I'll be rich. And so part of investing is whoops, looking back in history you got to realize things were super weird already. Russia closed down their market. Guess what? That had happened before, right? It's awfully nuts already. But so to become wedded to one particular outcome is often how people go broke. Now, they also tend to be concentrated. What's the old uh, a service? Charlie Munger, uh, liquors, ladies and leverage, the three L's, right? Leverage is a bad one. Liquor is the other one. Um, if it flies, floats, yeah. or 
ass. I think you own both of those, don't you? Uh, I had to get rid of the planes. I think it's one of the and hardest the things in and investing is to be asset class agnostic. And I know that will not be popular to almost anyone here. Um, but if you think about it through history, there's times when things look great and there's times when things look terrible. Bonds. I mean, how weird was that period? We had negative yielding sovereigns. I think the 100 year Aussie is down like what, uh, I mean, Australian, uh, uh, Austrian, excuse me, down 90%. US bonds right now, we do it. We're back to my polls on Twitter. I asked investors, I said, how much do you think? This is three years ago, uh, five years ago, 2018. I said, how much do you think US bonds have declined before? 10 year bond, almost everyone said zero to 10%. And I said, and by the way, T-bills, we wrote a paper called what's the safest asset in the world? Everyone said T-bills, T-bills. I said, after inflation, it's over half, right? Like that's not a safe asset, but people become wedded to things. And so talking about the trailing stops, thinking about opportunities, there's a great Morgan Housel, anyone know Morgan? He has a great quote where he's like, every previous decline looks like an opportunity. Every future decline looks like a risk. Meaning you look back in history, you're like, oh, I should have bought in 09. I would have totally bought in 09. Who did? And, you know, not that many people. I, I okay, you know. Um, but so many uh, struggle with, like, the emotional attachment. It's really hard. Um, anyway. Can I, can I jump in with a, a quick story about, um, uh, about, uh, about crisis, about times like this? So how many of you guys have, uh, know the name John Paulson, the famous uh, major hedge fund manager uh, made a lot of money on the big short on, on 07 and 08 uh, by shorting subprime mortgages. And also famously is, is a gold bug and remains one. Okay. But most people don't know that John Paulson made as much money in one trade in 2008 as he made on the entire bet in subprime. Does anybody know what that trade was? It was a six-week trade in October and November of 08, at the peak of the financial crisis. Anybody know what that was? True story. By the way, the same trade was recommended to you by one of the numbskulls in this audience, or in this panel. This, the, the, the fat one. He bought all he could buy of Budweiser. You guys may not remember this, but I recommended Budweiser in 06. And I said, put 25% of your portfolio in it. And the headline of that newsletter was, I'm afraid you won't buy enough. Why? Because it was free money. And as late as mid-October, the cash spread was $20 on an $80 buyout, all cash financing. You could have bought Bud at 60 and sold it at 80 in less than a month. That's a huge annualized return. I can't do that kind of math in my head, but there is no better way to make money. So what I'm telling you is the only way you have the opportunity to do that is if you have cash. So what I am telling you to do, and I want you to hear me, because you know for the next 20 years, I'm going to play clips of this and make you regret not doing it. You have got to raise serious amounts of cash and you have to do it now. By the time you see the VIX go to 40, it'll be too late. Your stocks will be down too much. And at that point, you've just got to hold through the fucking panic. So go raise some cash. There's got to be some bullshit that you know you're never going to get rich owning. Get rid of it. I'm not saying sell Hershey. I'm not saying, you know, sell your beach house that you love. I'm not saying sell anything that you have a high yield in. There's a guy in this room I know for a fact is a billionaire because of Walmart stock. I'm not saying sell your Walmart stock. I'm saying go raise some cash. You got some commercial buildings with iffy tenants, get rid of them. You got some crappy private in, in, in investments, you know, maybe like a razor company, get rid of it. <laughs> what? I don't know. Anyways, can you guys see my beard? I have one of those, by the way. <laughs> he uses it every day. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. It sits there on my counter. Looks nice. Anyways, uh, that, please do this. Please do this because there's no way that you'll be able to take advantage of these opportunities and they will emerge. I can't tell you exactly what it'll be. You know, like Rick Rule likes to say, I've got two balls, neither of them are crystal. I don't know. 
or or one of my one of my favorite lines was, I don't even know they ate bats in China. You know, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know that something is going to happen. There, there is just no way you can have the 10-year treasury yield at 5% and stocks trading at 25 times earnings. You cannot have that. That is not going to work. And I can tell you what's going to break. It's going to be stocks. It's going to be stocks because the consumer is going to roll over. That's going to happen. It is for sure going to happen. Is it going to happen next month? I don't know. It'll happen. And you got to be ready because it's too late once it starts. I mean, I think you nailed on the behavioral part of that, which was the hedonic treadmill. I mean, how many people here can relate to that, whether it's yourself or your children? But during what's, the, what's hedonic treadmill? But the, the, is, that the, like, is that like tantric? The, is that, the the getting is that, getting adjusted is that, to money is that something like uh, when, when you, you learn in yoga class when you what have when you have money I mean look at every lottery winner miserable right not only do the lottery winners go broke their neighbors go broke that's true by the way and so if you're looking at the two you're, if you're looking at the pandemic ton of people had money they had nothing to spend it on you adjusted that you had the stimmies you had all these programs. And then all of a sudden you come out of that and you're used to having money and then you spend it, but you don't go back to being thrifty. Like no one goes, that's a one way street, which is problematic from the consumer. I can standpoint. tell you all about that. <laughs> what do you, what do you mean I'm broke? <laughs> yeah. So Porter, um, I want to save a lot of this for tomorrow and both of you are going to be speaking. So that's fantastic. We'll save those things. Uh, one of our favorite segments is you just can't make this stuff up. And I feel like we live in clown world these days. Like everything is so bizarre and so insane that, you know, I'm talking to a lot of subscribers and of course, Porter, you know, I'm known at the office as a conspiracy guy, right? I won't get into the reptilian. That's saying a lot, the by world. the way, in this crowd yeah. to be known as that. That's well, saying a lot. I won't. Oh, he, he's, he's full bore. He thinks that like they're lizards and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, let's get a little <laughs> hand for the lizards running the world. The lizard, the lizard we've got some people? people in here. So anyways, I think we're going to see some wild things. Uh, over time, and I don't think any of us care about politics. I know that we're kind of agnostic and we're more libertarians, but unfortunately, politics do affect things, and we have the 2024 elections coming up, and of course, it's a total uh, S show right now, you know, with all the Trump stuff, all the indictments, uh, the Biden Hunter stuff. Um, he's not going to make it to the 2024, and of course, this stuff affects investments. Do you guys have any ideas or any take on uh, what you guys think is going to happen? Do you, do you know that? Does anyone know the single best election outcome indicator? Come on, nobody. It's the stock market. If it's up going into the election, it has a pretty high hit rate. We have an old post where we were like, you know, Hillary needs to start buying futures because going into the election, it didn't look so good. Um, by the way, the best trader here of anyone, Hillary, by the way. Um, was it cotton? What did she trade? Genius. Uh, Pelosi does great. So Med brings up great point. So it goes back to the it's the it's the economy, stupid. And everybody in here understands Bidenomics is a complete joke. So it, it's not going to happen. But one thing that I'm interested in personally is RFK being independent. I think RFK has done an incredible job of bringing a lot of crazy on, things to on, light. Hold on. RFK has said publicly on Twitter that he's going to ban all fracking in the United States. I didn't see that. You want to have that guy as your president? No, 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 no. No, I'm not saying he. I want him as that. What I'm saying is him running as independent is going to be uh, he's the Ross Perot. And it's going to throw a lot, a big wrench into the elections. And I'm gotcha. interested personally in seeing how that affects the Democrats trying to steal this thing. That's what I'd like to see. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a political analyst. But one thing that just occurs to me about all this is that uh, if I had told you guys way back in 2010 that America would continue to print money to pay for its own federal deficits and that you would see an enormous rise in violence and prostitution and drug abuse and suicides and the complete destruction of American cities. And if I said that we would go on to, 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 to run up $30 trillion in new debts, and that we would start behaving like a banana republic and that we're going to arrest a presidential candidate. Um, that we are going to, um, what's a, one of my favorite things going on right now in America? That we're going to um, 
if I just imagine if in 2010 I had told you that I was that the, the America was going to forbid you to leave your home, you would have never believed me. But somebody wrote a documentary in 2010 called The End of America and said every single one of these things would happen. And they all have. And, and what, what's terrible is what's coming next because none of this stuff is ever going to go away until there is a violent revolution in our country. So is that going to happen next year? No, I don't think so. But it's coming. And so in addition to trying to like make sure you own the right companies and make sure you do the right things with your cash, like get it out of Bank of America, I'm also telling you that these social, this, this, this social, sociologists call it anomie. And anomie flourishes in an environment where the paper money fails. Why? Because the failure of the money makes it impossible for us to contract with each other, to cooperate with each other. And it destroys the middle class, so it destroys all the values of the middle class. And that is what's really happening to our country. Am I wrong? What do you do about it? Protect yourself as best you can. I Gun, moved to medicine. Guns, guns, ammo, and get the hell out of the cities. Yeah, I got, I got laughed at by Porter. He mocked me a little bit. I took his end of America too seriously back in the day when I joined him, and I moved to Medellin, Colombia. And people say, why would you do that? Well, it's perfect weather. There's no GMO. It's local farmers. By the way, it's fresh in, water. In, in Colombia, he's Brad Pitt. Well, that, that's also true. I'm a five foot, I'm five foot six and a half, forgotten about guy here. I'm Brad Pitt Fight Club version Where, down there with the, the ladies. So, Is that the hair? I'm giving, I'm, that's with the shoes on right here. <laughs> that's the shoes. My body fat percentage is looking good, though. But, anyways, Wait, I'll tell you guys that I've, uh, I've, have a new perspective and we've talked about it recently it's a homogeneous culture where it's one culture there's no division down there and although you have how many genders are there in colombia there's two there's two and it's very masculine and it's very feminine and i think that's very healthy for a culture because it requires in a third world country protection is required and the man is the protector and and the woman uh, of course they work and, and they have to and but they also take care of the family and I think that's a very beautiful thing So you're talking uh, about I, I would suggest that you guys look at alternate uh, alternate ideas for uh, Setting up a plan B. That's just my personal thing. I'm going to have I have a piece of land That's two and a half acres on a lake. I'm going to have a majordomo is what they call it It's a, a couple that will live out there. I'll have a greenhouse with all of my own fruits and vegetables a chicken coop uh, I'll have a beautiful cabin that I'm building for $160,000, a boat. I'll be completely left alone, and it's absolute paradise. And the dollar goes infinitely. So if you guys want to talk about that, uh, please email me, and I'll be happy to talk to you guys about these things. We can do a port. This is Colombia. South America. Colombia, yes. Not, not South America. Yeah, we, we uh, not South Carolina. We, um... Porter and Coke uh, retreat. We could do that there. I, I'm, I'm, I'm up for that. Um, can I tell a Columbia story? Please. So I, I think this is um, an interesting um, way to think about things because going back to sentiment, okay, I was down in Bogota and I was, first of all, thinking walking around, I was like, God, I'm out of shape. I am fat right now, but it's pretty high. Altitude. It's the altitude, so okay. it's 7,000 feet. So I was at an institutional investing conference. This is probably a decade ago. Let's call it 2014. And I gave a speech, and I said, look, beautiful people, amazing country, um, great food. Everything has been awesome. Your stock market is one of the most expensive in the world. Silence, just like this. Afterwards, I mean, it was one of the most awkward presentations I've ever given. I said, your, your stock market is in a bubble. In the little um, you know, uh, hallway afterwards, at uh, one, of the, one of the little breakouts, person after person after person after person said, came up to me and said, Meb, 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 you don't understand. The pension funds put in whatever the number was, 10 billion every month. X amount every month. Oil's at 120. The stock market cannot go down. I said, look, I don't know. I'm just a quant. I just, I'm just saying, on average, this is expensive. The stock market is probably down, I don't know, 70% since then, maybe 80 on a real basis even more. 
Now I want them to invite me back to finally say you have one of the cheapest stock markets in the world right now. Now you should be buying, but here's the thing, no one cares. When you go back and you talk to people, they say, no shit, buddy, but nobody has any money. And so when you talk to people in the United States, now I'm giving away part of mine tomorrow, and let me be clear, the most important thing when you talk to someone, say, what are your incentives, right? Like my biggest fund, we manage $2 billion, we have a dozen funds. My biggest fund by far is a long only US stock fund. Over this last cycle, how many people have you talked to the, the number one most universally held belief in all of investing, if I had to ask you guys to write it down, is stocks for the long run. Stocks beat bonds, right? Like everyone believes, I don't know a single person that does not believe that. And during this last cycle, this zero interest rate environment, everyone said, but it's okay for stocks to be expensive because bond yields are zero. I, I didn't say that. Which, by the way, I wrote a blog post, which no one read, which, which debunked that and said, is that actually true? And yes, it is kind of true. Stocks actually do great when bond yields are low because the reason bond yields are low is because everything had hit the fan for the past decade. Stock returns were terrible. Inflation was high. Stock valuations were super low. None of that was true over the last part of this cycle. But the sentiment, my goodness, at, do you guys remember February 2021? We have a Twitter thread called, for my North Carolina peeps, what in tarnation? My mom, my grandmother used to say that phrase, what in tarnation are you doing, Meb, Bring all this mud in the house? Whatever it was, what in tarnation? And it was tweet after tweet after tweet of the craziness going on. Options trading, there was- uh, FTX. The, the sentiment surveys that keep going up. What do you expect on the stock market? It got as high as 17% a year, which sounds insane. But that was what people were saying in 99, which by the way, would have been me. I was in college at the time. I thought I could do 20% a year, no problem. <laughs> but you do not hear anyone now saying, now that interest rates have gone from zero to five, oh wait, okay, so hold on. It's still okay for stocks to be expensive because bond, well, wait, hold on, none of that, everything breaks. And uh, there's a preview of tomorrow. We're actually super bullish on some things but on aggregate, the stock market, the broad market cap weight is super fragile. All right, guys. Well, we don't want to bore you anymore because these guys have to save their speeches for tomorrow. And I feel like I just keep digging in and getting them to reveal more and more. Uh, great start to the night. Let me tell you, uh, I was so honored to join Porter again. I left in 2015. I did my own thing. I went out on my own. And uh, I promised him that I would apply everything that I sat in his office for he, four and a half he, years. He, he started a global diet business. You can tell I wasn't a subscriber. <laughs> but what I promised Porter was, I want to apply everything that you ever taught me. And I did that. And I'm very honored. I, I owe the world to this guy. I, I actually, he's done more for me than anybody else. And I think he's done that for a lot of subscribers Ooh. here. And I want to thank him very much. And when he called me why, out of the bull, why, you don't need to stop. Just keep going. When, yeah. When he called me, yeah. when he called me out of the bullpen, go on. <laughs> he called me out of the bullpen and he yeah. said, "Brabzy, yeah. I need you back. I need you to run the marketing. I need you to keep the integrity of our message." Uh, I was so honored, and uh, it wouldn't be I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you guys. Trust me. He, you know what he told me when he hired me. We got six months, and if we can't make this happen, we're shutting it down. And thanks to every single one you of you. You guys right all here. came in immediately and made everything that we're doing now possible and what we're going to do next possible. And, uh, man, I just can't wait to show you the quality of the work that we're going to be able to produce for you. I'm super excited about it. And uh, our next product is going to be a biotech thing. And I've got, uh, I've got a guy who spent 30 years in VC and biotech. He's a Rhodes Scholar. And uh, he's retired from doing VC work, and all he wants to do is help all of us make a lot more money in biotech. So it's going to be great. Very excited. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for listening to the Porter & Company Black Label Podcast with your hosts, Porter Stansberry and Aaron Brabham. We'll see you soon.